Hey everybody, and welcome back to the channel. Uh, it has been over three and a half years of me hopefully waiting for a moment like this, and uh, I'm really freaking stoked that we got there. So we hit 100,000 subscribers, which is cool. Um, I'm really happy about it, but also I, to me it just means that I've gotten to help a lot of people along the way, which is what's most important. And uh, yeah, I think one of the things that I'm now planning on doing is shifting the direction of the channel a little bit. Um, in favor of me writing a little bit more code. Uh, I've made these systems design interview videos for a long time. I feel like they've gone really far, both in my personal development and at least according to you guys, some of your own development. Um, but I now feel like the place where I'm gonna get the most personal development is starting to write some code. So as you can see, um, you know, I've grown out my beard in the true spirit of a nice neck beard open source contributor. Uh, I look gross, I feel gross, and uh, it's good. I've been writing a little bit of code in uh, the Trino repository, and I'm at least going to try and get that committed. So let's go ahead and talk about what I'm doing. I will make a proper 100,000 subscriber video, but uh, you know I'll save it for when I can do a little bit more planning on it. Anyways, let's go talk about some coding. All right, so we'll talk about some of the work that I've done. Uh, this is going to be really informal. Um, Maybe some people were expecting to like actually watch me coding. I think the truth of the matter is that after doing that for a little bit, you know, like realistically watching me code is like I sit there and like curse into my microphone for a little bit and then like don't talk and then maybe I take like three or four breaks to jerk off and like, you know, that's about it. So I can't imagine that anyone really wants to see me doing that. I feel like it's more interesting for, for both you and I to, to get some conclusions and also a little bit more of the thought process uh, that was involved with some of the work that I've done. And uh, keep in mind as well that it's not like I have like, you know, I don't know, 40 spare hours a week to throw at whatever it is that I'm doing. So the progress that I make is pretty, uh, you know, minimal. It's maybe like five to six hours of coding a week, maybe eight if I'm lucky. Uh, but, you know, don't expect anything too crazy out of me. But I think if there's one lesson to learn from this channel in general, it's that, you know, when you do something uh, over a, a very long period of months or even years, you can get pretty far. And uh, that's kind of my guiding philosophy. It's definitely helped with me becoming better at all this systems design stuff, which was, you know, starting at zero and spending pretty much a lot of the last three and change years learning about it. So I guess, you know, now I'll get to talk a little bit about what I've tried to do over the past week. So from the week prior to this one, basically the last update that I left was something in this document right here, which is that the first thing I wanted to try out was basically modifying Trino to make it um, so that when you pull in existing data sources from Trino, uh, you can always perform snapshot reads. Uh, the reason being that when I you know, inevitably try and build this data harness, I have to rely on the ability to read from all data sources at a particular timestamp. That's how we ensure transactional isolation between two different data sources. If Trino is always seeing the data from every single data source in flux constantly, then we can't have uh, you know, transactions from one data source to another. So basically my philosophy here is that I first want to make the changes to the relevant connectors and then eventually I'll try and make um, a connector myself for the data harness specifically, which then delegates to all of the other Trino connectors to perform query federation. So what this really means in practice is that the first thing I did was go through a bunch of documentation for existing connectors in Trino and try and figure out how they actually work. So where I started was Kafka. So I'm going to just jump over here to some Kafka connector documentation. I think there's a lot going on here and uh, a lot of it is basically devoted to like, hey, we have this Kafka topic, um, messages in Kafka are just byte arrays, how do we actually convert that byte array to a table? Um, so you know, you can use like a Kafka confluence schema registry to do that, uh, you can use protobuf, you can use JSON, and you know, sometimes you're actually going to have to like kind of provide how that works for you over here. Um, but what I was more focused on was basically actually in the first two lines of the description, which is this part right here. Saying, topics can be live, rows appear as data arrives and disappear as segments get dropped. This can result in strange behavior if accessing the table multiple times in a single query, e.g. performing a self-join. So what I want you to kind of get out of a line like that is basically saying, okay, when we read from Kafka, we're just going to read whatever data currently exists in the topic and we're going to read all of it. And for me personally, that's actually kind of against what I'm looking to do because I want to be able to have a user say, you know, I only care about these two start and end offsets on a particular topic and maybe certain partitions of that topic. And I only want to be able to read those. And so I can actually even go into the Hootie code over here and try and demonstrate a little bit uh, how this used to work. But basically you've got this class over here called Kafka Split Manager. 
I'm gonna try and increase the font a little bit more because otherwise it could be a little bit hard to see. And basically the gist of this one is that in the before times, you know, prior to doing any of this, you would have um, you know, a split that you're reading from and the way that you would get the partition info as well as the beginning offsets and ending offsets of those partitions was you would basically just establish a Kafka consumer, right? So a connection to the Kafka brokers and you would call this method called um, partitions for and then from there that would give you the partition information and then you would also call this method begin offsets and ending offsets which is basically just going to actual Kafka itself and saying hey what are the highest and lowest known offsets for these topics now that's good because it always gives you an up-to-date view of what's actually in those Kafka queues but it's not great because it doesn't give you um, the ability to perform snapshot reads or repeatable reads which is what we're really looking for in this whole thing. So basically that's what I started out in this change looking to do and um, you know I very much looked at those documents. Uh, for what it's worth, actually, if you look at certain other things that have Kafka connectors, the functionality can actually be a little bit different. So. Um, you know, I was kind of cross-referencing this with the Spark documents for how they read Kafka. And so one interesting thing is, you know, Spark, you can read Kafka live because that's how they have like Spark structured streaming. But you can also do this thing where you're creating a Kafka source for batch queries. And when we're reading batch queries, you can notice that actually in this little code snippet that they give right here, I'm just going to highlight the two lines in particular, you've got starting offsets and ending offsets. So you can see that for every single topic, I can name each partition, that partition start offset, the other partition start offset, and then I can also name some end offsets. So same idea, I have that topic, and then for to uh, partition zero of topic one, end offset is 50, and then you know for partition one, end offset is negative one. So the idea here is that Spark supports snapshot reads, but actually if you go through and look at the Spark documentation a little bit more, um, they basically only have these very uh, generic columns for all the data in Kafka. So they don't actually allow you to deserialize the message and present that as like a SQL table, whereas Trino does. Now, for the sake of my demo that I'm gonna do in a little bit for this video, uh, you're not gonna see that, but I guess the point is that you can do it and that's also eventually gonna come in very handy for what it is that I'm trying to build, right? Because what I care about is basically being able to have Kafka data uh, and represent that as part of like this big table that I'm trying to build. So you can do all this type mapping where you have, uh, you know, you can basically decode things as CSVs or JSONs or, or Avro. You know, if you're writing Avro payloads into a Kafka topic, then you can use the Confluent schema registry to now deserialize that into a schema that gets displayed to you as a table in Trino. So in terms of like how I actually got set up, um, fortunately for the Kafka connector, there is a Trino tutorial. Uh, which allows you to get up and going pretty quickly. Um, you can install Kafka very easily. It's worth noting that this tutorial uses Kafka 0.8.1. And uh, you know, since then, what am I using? I'm using Kafka 2.1.3. So there have been a lot of changes since then. So the tutorial doesn't actually work anymore, but you can kind of you know, like hack at it a little bit and get things to work just fine. So basically this is just saying, go download Kafka, put some data in the Kafka queue, uh, you know, make a little file in your local Trino instance to set up the Kafka uh, connection, and then now all of a sudden you can query from it. I use the uh, official Kafka quick start menu as well to basically set up a topic called Jordan, and then I wrote a couple of messages into it. So let me just go back to IntelliJ. I've got these tabs in my terminal right here, which are showing you what I'm doing. So for example, in my Kafka topic, which is called Jordan, I've got a message at offset zero, which says, God, I hope Corinna Koff sees this. And then a message at offset one called, God, I hope my girlfriend doesn't get mad about that. And you can actually see that I'm currently running a, a local Trino instance, and I've queried this uh, topic of mine, which I've set up in this file right here, which is very similar to, um, you know, kind of what I have in the connector, or in the tutorial for the Kafka connector. And you can see that at partition zero and um, you know offset zero, I can see all these messages that are currently in the topic. And if I added a new one and queried it again, um, I would also basically be able to see that. So my goal of this was to be able to say, okay, well, it's great that I always see exactly what's in this Kafka topic and exactly what's in this partition, um, but sometimes you don't exactly want that, right? Sometimes you want to be able to only see a subset of the topic so that you have uh, consistency within your table. 
So I'm gonna quickly go to the documentation that I wrote here because frankly, I can't even remember how to use what it is that I wrote. Um, but I added this little snippet to the Kafka connector documentation and I'm just gonna go ahead and copy paste it. So in Trino, there's this concept of session variables. So a session variable is something that's ephemeral and ephemeral and it's used per user. And so the idea is I can now, uh, I created a new session variable that allows me to basically uh, you know, provide the overrides for every single uh, Kafka topic partition that I'm reading from, and then use those instead of the existing ones, which are just like the lowest known start offset and the highest known end offset. So for example, you can see I've kind of encoded this a certain way. My Kafka topic is called Jordan. Um, the partition number, as you can see in the left side of the screen here, is gonna be zero. So it's Jordan at partition zero. And then I'm reading between offsets zero and two right now because the end offset is exclusive. So let's say I only wanted to see the first message, which is God, I hope Karinikov sees this. I'm gonna change the string to basically say, okay, we're gonna read from Jordan partition zero uh, from offset zero to one. So I'm gonna set this session variable. Hopefully that works. Looks like we did. And now if I select star from this Kafka queue again, let's see what actually happens. Look at that. I hope Karinikov sees this. So you might think, oh, this is a pretty mundane change, right? Like it's not really gonna allow you to do anything. But at the core, what I've now done is I've basically extended that Kafka splits manager class or Kafka split manager to take in a new object, which is going to, in practice, basically uh, be called the Tafik partition offset provider. So this is now going to be just some sort of interface that we take into this class show you guys the interface. And all it's gonna do is it's gonna provide us with offset ranges per partition. It takes in the Kafka consumer class, it takes in a topic name, and it also takes in a connector session, uh, which is how we actually see the value of this uh, session variable that I overrode. But basically the gist is here, um, you know, I can now make multiple different implementations of this guy. And by doing so, I can now use that in order to um, ultimately build out the data harness that I want to build out because eventually I'm going to delegate to the Kafka um, connector, but I'm going to provide a different topic partition offset provider implementation. And that way I'm going to be able to read from different uh, offsets in each Kafka topic partition. Um, so a few things that generally came up for me uh, so far in making this change, um, and I'll just go through them. So for one, uh, although I am a Java guy, that's what I use at work and it works nicely. Um, I typically use Dagger for dependency injection. Um, Trino uses Juice, which is a little bit different. Juice is doing injection at runtime as opposed to compile time. So a little bit harder to get the exact same safeties there, I guess. Like I don't know when I compile my code if the dependency injection that I'm doing was working. So a little bit of a learning curve there. Um, and then when it comes to actually like trying to commit an open source change to Trino, um, I noticed that a few things are obviously gonna be a little bit more tedious. Uh, for one, uh, you have to sign some sort of licensing agreement, which I still haven't even gotten back, so I don't know if I'm gonna be able to commit this thing. I have no clue what the timeline is gonna be of anyone reviewing my code. At some point, I may just not be able to, and if that happens, I'm gonna have to build a Trino connector, but it's just gonna have to be like an external um, you know, Java package that you can download when running your own G uh, Trino cluster. Another thing is this is the first time I've been reviewed by AI before. Um, that shat on me. And it, like, I can't lie, it was pretty good. Um, like it caught a couple of bugs in my code uh, when it came to like the parsing of that session variable to pick out um, offsets per topic partition. And uh, yeah, that kind of fucked me up a little bit. So uh, my job is gone uh, probably from the next couple of years. Um, obviously you have to write a decent amount of tests. I mean, that's pretty standard, right? Like you would do that regardless. Um, but I, admittedly, I kind of uh, did not give a wholehearted effort the first time around and the AI bot uh, made me do so. And then uh, also I didn't realize that uh, for these open source projects, you have to like fork them and do a pull request from your fork. I figured you could just make a branch on the main project and, and do that. But you know, now that I think about it, that would be stupid because then everyone would have to be able to see and download my branch, which is not necessarily what I want. Um, a nice thing about Trino in general and these open source projects is that like they can and should be documented pretty well and I'm trying to keep up that culture so you can see that um, I added some changes to the markdown file for the Kafka connector. I added basically this flag which is gonna allow you to even add that session variable in the first place about whether to allow um, overriding offsets. And then in addition to that, I also just added, let's see, I think one more section to be a little bit more exact and show people how to use that session level variable. 
Um, so now, uh, you know, you can read these offsets over here, blah, 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 do all that fun stuff. And then, you know, now we wait. I've got my little uh, pull request right here. Um, I need this CLA to get signed, so I submitted my email to do so. And uh, I hope that works out. But, uh, you know, I think this is probably in about as decent of a state that it can be in for the time being before a human actually comes around and reviews it. So probably in the meantime, I'll move on to something else. So, you know, in terms of what that something else is, what I'm thinking right now is um, I noticed that the hoodie connector, so hold on, let me look this up for you guys, Trino hoodie connector. I noticed that this guy does not support any notion of basically um, time travel queries. So they call them snapshot queries, but I, sorry, I don't think you can basically do a read as of a certain time in the hoodie Trino connector. And um, I think that's something that I'm ultimately gonna have to work with. So I'm gonna have to figure out how to create a local hoodie table. It seems that Trino only allows you reading from hoodie if you use a Hive Metastore. So I can't just like use a, a super local hoodie table that doesn't have any sort of um, Hive Metastore uh, catalog. So long story short, uh, you know, that'll probably be the subject of the next video and that'll be the work that I do this week. Um, I'm probably not too prepared to even talk about it very much yet just because I haven't done all the research that I can. I will say just on some of my initial research, this looks a little bit concerning right here. So in Hoodie, uh, you have this concept of copy on write and merge on read tables. I started to speak about those a little bit uh, in the introductory video to this series. But the idea is if, you know, Trino is only supporting read optimized queries for merge on read tables, that means that like any of the incremental data that you write to your merge on read table before that data is compacted down into the base files does not get read into uh, Trino, which I think is a little bit concerning. Maybe I'll make that a longer term feature that I try and uh, work on, but that's also gonna be a little bit harder. Um, so for now, maybe I'll just support, um, you know, copy on write hoodie tables in, uh, in what it is that I'm building, but we'll see. Anyways, it's been a lot of fun so far. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm learning a good amount and I'm hoping that like I can actually make a difference here and that people will review my change. Uh, you know, I don't really know what the timeline looks like for committing to open source since this is really like the, the first time I'm actually doing it. So, you know, that's why the neck beard is growing out. The social skills are decreasing rapidly, but it's been a good time. And, uh, you know, I appreciate those of you who have uh, stayed along for the ride. Again, you know, I'm super grateful and uh, honored to have had any semblance of an audience at this point. Um, you know, when I started this thing out, like, <sighs> in 2022, I was really just talking into the void. Um, I didn't really think that anyone would ever really care or watch this channel. And, you know, that's also part of the reason that I was saying some ludicrous and outrageous shit on it, which was a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, like all things, the channel has evolved to some extent, and uh, so have I, and so have my goals, and I hope that I'm going down a road that is at least somewhat interesting for people. If not, hopefully you can take solace in the fact that I'm having fun with what I'm doing, and, uh, you know, I think I'm moving in the right direction here. Not only does this uh, just really interest me, I think it also helps me become an engineer, a better engineer at work, um, you know, contribute back to the data community further, and uh, yeah, it's just been a good time. So, I really appreciate you guys. Thanks for keeping me in this for so long. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to do it without the positive support that I received from all of you. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all in the next one.